January 2013, 4,000 French soldiers are deployed in Mali. Their mission, to stop separatist Tuareg rebels advancing on the capital, Bamako. But Operation Serval is different from the long series of interventions by France in its former African colonies. Today, the French are not the only ones with interests in the region. They have to deal with new players, China, and now the United States. Africa is now a key territory on the global chessboard of the 21st century. From Libya to the Central African Republic, from South Sudan to Northern Mali, conflict and chaos has spread throughout the continent. At the heart of this turmoil, a strategic territory, the Sahel. The vast region that straddles the Sahara to the north and the savannas in the south has become an important new front in the so-called war against terrorism. But is the official narrative the fight against terrorism, masking a larger battle. The resources are plentiful. They, there's gas, there's oil, there's coltan, uh, gold, uh, copper, and, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Toute la 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 période actuelle est marquée par ce qu'on pourrait appeler a new scramble for Africa, c'est-à-dire un nouveau partage de l'Afrique. The resource wars of the 21st century have already begun. At the center of today's troubled region of the Sahel is the nation of Mali, among the poorest in the world. Unemployment is rampant, and most people survive hand to mouth. Yet, in the 13th century, the Mali Empire extended over much of West Africa and was extraordinarily wealthy and powerful. Salt, ivory and gold made it a major crossroad for global trade of the time. But inevitably, these riches would lead to conquests. Nous avons le sentiment d'être en continuité d'une histoire. Nous sommes la transition entre l'Afrique du Nord et l'Afrique eh, qui touche eh, l'océan, l'Afrique forestière. Et donc, ce, ce point de vue fait que nous avons une position stratégique essentielle Qui contrôle le Mali contrôle l'Afrique de l'Ouest, pour ne pas dire l'Afrique. C'est une position, c'est absolument clair. Et, et, et donc, cet espace devient un espace de convoitise. The imperial European powers unveiled their plans to colonize Mali and the rest of Africa at the Berlin Conference in 1885. La colonisation s'est présentée comme une véritable rupture. Rupture, je veux dire, c'est même une césure, hein, comme on dit, c'est-à-dire c'est une opération presque chirurgicale. Britain, Belgium, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Italy and France each got their share. The French colonial empire extended over much of Western and Northern Africa. It provided the raw materials like the oil from Algeria necessary for the industrial and military rise of post-war France. On September 13, 1960, France detonated its first atomic bomb in Regan, in the Algerian Sahara. Le fil rouge, c'est le pétrole et l'uranium. L'uranium, c'est l'uranium du Niger. 
quand on parle d'uranium, ce n'est pas simplement euh, l'uranium, on pense toujours aux centrales euh, d'Areva maintenant, mais l'uranium, c'était pendant très longtemps surtout de l'uranium militaire pour la force de dissuasion nucléaire française. Donc on voit bien que c'est intéressant de voir que finalement le Sahara, c'est quand même toujours le minerai le plus stratégique de la puissance nucléaire. Et quand la France, a, si elle a eu son fauteuil et son poste au Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies, c'est non seulement parce que c'est une puissance nucléaire, mais aussi pour ses intérêts en Afrique. Et les deux sont liés, c'est-à-dire l'Afrique nucléaire, et c'est ce qui donne à la France finalement son rôle de puissance moyenne. But the winds of freedom were blowing across Africa, and France was to lose all its colonies. The independence of Algeria was particularly painful, in part because of its strategic oil reserves. After eight years of bloody fighting, the French were forced to withdraw. Il faut pas oublier que quand la France euh, euh, s'est fait euh, virer de l'Algérie, c'est vrai qu'il fallait trouver pour la France, pour De Gaulle, il fallait trouver euh, du pétrole euh, ailleurs, et il a trouvé ce pétrole en Afrique subsaharienne, en particulier dans les pays comme le Gabon, le Congo. But the euphoria of independence was short-lived and masked a new reality. France retained troops, bases, and political influence over its former colonies. The policy of France-Afrique was born. C'était tellement un système intégré politique, militaire, économique euh, qu'il n'était pas question euh, de qui a un contrat important qui échappe à la France, non seulement dans son précaré, mais même hors de son précaré. À partir du moment où elle était puissante sur le plan sécuritaire, il suffisait de passer un coup de fil à un chef d'État pour avoir les contrats, sans appel d'offres, bien évidemment, puisque la France était le gendarme de l'Afrique et défendait l'Occident dans toute cette région. But France's absolute dominance did not last. In the 60s, the discovery of huge oil reserves in the Gulf of Guinea attracted a new player, the United States. Pendant toute la période de la guerre froide, Français et Américains étaient en concurrence sur le continent africain. Des grands groupes comme Total contre des groupes comme Exxon et autres. Il y avait toujours des, euh, on voyait des enjeux stratégiques dans le domaine du pétrole important. The United States made military as well as economic investments on the African continent. Africa became a battleground in the Cold War. To counter Soviet interests, the Americans secretly supported armed rebellions in Ethiopia and Angola. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States was the only superpower in the world. In 1992, under the auspices of the United Nations, it launched a so-called humanitarian intervention in the strategic Horn of Africa. The U.S. sent 28,000 soldiers to Somalia to help put an end to a civil war. The operation ended in disaster two years later, after American soldiers were captured and killed. Images of their mutilated bodies broadcast around the world. For the US, it was a humiliating loss, and they decided to withdraw. After Somalia, a new threat emerged in Africa. The 1998 attacks against two U.S. embassies raised the alarm in Washington. Massive car bombs in Kenya and Tanzania caused the death of over 200 people and left thousands injured. A group called Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility. Its leader, the little-known Osama bin Laden became number one in the United States, and the hunt to track him down began. The attack on the World Trade Center reconfigured the geopolitics of the world. The United States launched a war in Afghanistan, a war that would soon spread 
far beyond. It was uh, post 9-11. The threat of terrorism was very real to the American public. And uh, from, from a policy standpoint, we were looking for uh, specifically at the threat wherever it may, it may show up. A few months after September 11, the U.S. military returned to the Horn of Africa with plans to stay. They established their first military base in Djibouti at Camp Le Monnier, a former French Foreign Legion fort. Rudolf Attala directed counterterrorism efforts in Africa for the U.S. Department of Defense. The Sahel played a key role in, in, in uh, looking at uh, the movement of weapons, the movement of potential foreign fighters, um, organized crime. Um, during that time period, you also had an influx of cocaine flowing in through the Sahel. So all of this was, was of primary interest and, and, it, and it continued to grow. The Pentagon produced a series of maps in 2002, marking off this whole part of Africa as a terrorist corridor, corridor of terrorism. And of course, the official narrative from the, the, the uh, Pentagon and the White Department is that these terrorists had come from Afghanistan. They'd been driven out by American forces, which you now know they weren't, but the narrative at the time was they've crossed through bin Laden country, i.e. Sudan. They're linking up with terrorists in North Africa. They've come through this sort of belt, this banana-shaped area. Jeremy Keenan, a British professor and author, has spent 40 years studying the Sahara. He argues that the military engagement of the United States in the region was about more than just security. There had been in America probably something much more important at the time than 9-11, that was the publication of a thing that's known generally as the Cheney Report. And the Cheney Report, I think, was the first executive order that President Bush gave when he came into power, which was to look at the crisis of the energy sector in the States. In 1997, imports of energy oil had surpassed the 50% level. And that was psychologically sort of crisis level. In that report, it focused on future American supplies of oil, and of course, it focused on Africa, as becoming the most important supplier of good quality oil that would fit the American internal infrastructural system, uh, you know, even more important than the Gulf. So suddenly, Africa becomes of critical importance to, if you like, the political classes in, in Washington. Of strategic interest is the Sahel. To the north, Algeria and Libya, the largest oil reserves in Africa. And to the south, those of the Gulf of Guinea. The vast untapped petroleum deposits in the Sahara itself were another temptation. In 2003, a dramatic kidnapping paved the way for the arrival of the US military. Une trentaine de touristes européens ont disparu dans le Sahara algérien depuis plusieurs semaines, principalement des Allemands et des Autrichiens qui voyageaient, euh, semble-t-il, sans guide. This was the first act against foreigners in the Sahara. A huge manhunt was launched. For five months, the kidnappers evaded capture. In the end, after a ransom was paid by the German government, the tourists were released. Four days later, reporters based in Algeria received a fax. A veteran of the Algerian army, El Para, the paratrooper, claimed responsibility for the kidnappings. His so-called terrorist background was leaked by Algerian intelligence officials. Such unsubstantiated evidence was all the Bush administration needed to label El Para Osama bin Laden's man in the Sahara. Suddenly we have, uh, officially speaking, the extension, if you like, of Al-Qaeda right into this part of Africa. Uh, and that is what legitimized for America launching a new front in the war on terror in Africa. There was a big manhunt for the, the leader, uh, the, the, the head kidnapper, Abdel Riza al Par, in order to, to nab him because he was running around with approximately 5 million euros and maybe a potential threat in the future. So. 
uh, there was some thinking um, on the Department of Defense side, and we came up with a program called PSI, the Pan-Sahel Initiative. And, and the Pan-Sahel Initiative basically was to work with countries in the Sahel, like Mali, like Niger, uh, like Chad, Mauritania, in order to uh, give them some of the basics, uh, um, communication equipment where they can talk to each other cross-border, um, just simple stuff to where they can help us find um, El Para. El Para was eventually captured with the help of the United States. The U.S. Armed Forces now had a foothold in the Sahara, and they wanted more. Why don't we take this little thing called PSI and make it a little bit more robust, where we start taking countries from within the region, the Sahelian region, and became TSCTP, the Trans-Sahel Counterterrorism Program and trying to get them all to work on something that we all care about, which is counterterrorism. So we'll do training and equipping, um, and all in this training and equipping, then we come together and bring those countries to do a live exercise. And so we bring all these countries together, we do this live exercise, we flex our muscles in the region and kind of send a message to the bad guys saying, don't mess around, everybody's working together in concert to make sure that you guys aren't around. So everybody in the Pentagon said, well, this was a success story. Um, you know, how can we make this even better? Deterring and defeating transnational threats preventing future conflicts, supporting humanitarian and disaster relief efforts, and protecting U.S. security interests. That's the mission of U.S. Africa Command. They decided that maybe they needed a separate command, a headquarters, that would focus exclusively on Africa. And so the Bush administration, under uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was running the Pentagon at the time, decided to, to do that, set up a separate command just for Africa. The United States is the only country to have divided the world into separate military sectors to monitor and patrol. These are NORTHCOM, PACOM, SOUTHCOM, UCOM, CENTCOM, and now AFRICOM. Under the stated goals of fighting terrorism and providing humanitarian assistance, AFRICOM implanted itself on the continent, conducting military exercises with a growing number of African countries. But was this the only reason for AFRICOM? Je pense qu'il y a une corrélation totale entre la lutte antiterroriste et les intérêts américains sur le continent. Ça n'a pas évolué. Dans un premier temps, les Américains laissent la France ou un certain de pays occidentaux euh, euh, assurer la sécurité euh, dans leurs anciennes colonies, mais qu'à long terme, ils restent présents parce que la bagarre à long terme sera vraiment euh, avec la, la, la Chine. Beijing had firmly established itself as a counterweight to French and American interests on the continent. In the first decade of the 21st century, China had overtaken the rest of the world to become Africa's largest trading partner. The Chinois sont arrivés sur ce continent au moment où euh, finalement toutes les puissances occidentales et en particulier les Français étaient en train de donner des leçons aux Africains en disant il faut aller, il faut faire des élections, il faut aller à la démocratie euh, et puis surtout il y avait euh, les plans d'ajustement structurel du FMI et de la Banque mondiale. Les Chinois sont arrivés, ils ont dit aux Africains nous on ne vous donne pas de leçons, on ne s'ingère pas dans vos affaires euh, politiques. Les dettes, on vous donne tout l'argent finalement. Les Occidentaux, c'est très bien, ils vous ont annulé les dettes, ils ont passé l'ardoise. Mais nous, vous, auprès de nous, vous pouvez, on vous donne des prêts euh, énormes euh, à taux zéro. Euh, donc ils ont fait le contraire de ce qu'ont fait les Français et les Occidentaux. Et ils sont devenus euh, les rois du pétrole, c'est le cas de le dire. Ça veut dire qu'ils ont accès à toutes les matières premières stratégiques. In this 2010 U.S. State Department cable made public by WikiLeaks, a U.S. Assistant Secretary of State calls China a very aggressive and pernicious economic competitor 
with no morals. Ultimately, the aim of the United States in Africa is to uh, develop mechanisms where uh, access to resources that are strategic, that are absolutely essential to several key industries in the United States, as well as access to uh, petroleum, uh, are, is secured. That it also provides a counterweight to China. Uh, China is also in somewhat of a race to acquire as many minerals and uh, petroleum and other natural resources that it needs for its industries. The United States, though it may no longer be a major manufacturing power, its military industries are heavily dependent on minerals that can be only sourced in Africa. The establishment of AFRICOM was key for the consolidation of U.S. interests in Africa. But when the Pentagon wanted to set up its headquarters on the continent, things did not go as planned. The Americans wanted to establish the siège d'AFRICOM ainsi qu'un siège de la CIA pour l'Afrique au Mali. Le problème, c'est que les Africains euh, ont une position commune actuellement de refuser l'établissement de nouvelles bases militaires. This opposition forced the U.S. to set up the command of AFRICOM thousands of miles away, in Stuttgart, Germany. African resistance to AFRICOM was spearheaded by a figure who had emerged as a major economic and political force on the continent and had been a thorn in the side of the West for decades. From the beginning of his political career as a leader, Muammar Gaddafi was opposed to a foreign military presence in Africa. One of the first things he did after coming to power in 1969 was to expel the British and US military bases in Libya itself. And Gaddafi had, you know, considerable political support across the continent for his position. Uh, Nelson Mandela's view was almost identical to Gaddafi's, that there would be no African forces commanded by foreign military officials and there would be no foreign militaries uh, occupying any part of Africa or operating within Africa. Gaddafi had been playing a complex game with the West for a long time. President Ronald Reagan had labeled him the mad dog of the Middle East and had tried to assassinate him in 1986 by bombing his palace. The Libyan leader's independence and influence flowed from the vast petroleum reserves, the largest in Africa, which he had nationalized when he took power. Well, starting in the 1990s, Muammar Gaddafi became a kind of luminary, a leading voice, certainly one of the loudest voices, for a maximum vision of African integration. He was seen across Africa as being uh, the successor of Kwame Nkrumah in terms of his vision of African unity. And it wasn't just a matter of nice sounding words. Uh, Gaddafi was eager to not only accelerate the process of African integration, but of bankrolling the process. The money from Libyan oil allowed Gaddafi to underwrite ambitious projects. $300 million for the first Pan-African satellite, RASCOM. $30 billion in the largest irrigation system in the world that draws on the vast reserves of fresh water under the Sahara to turn tens of thousands of hectares of Libyan desert into farmland. Gaddafi wanted to demonstrate that Africa could develop without depending on the Western banking system or the International Monetary Fund. Libya, to the tune of tens of billions of dollars in each case, was capitalizing a number of new African economic institutions, uh, the African Development Bank, the African Monetary Fund. Africa would then develop its own solutions and, and, and develop its own lending programs to address its own problems. So Africa was, in Gaddafi's view, uh, and with Gaddafi's leadership, increasingly becoming something of a block, rather than a series of disparate individual nations that could be dealt with one-on-one -on -one and set against each other. 
When Gaddafi was elected chairman of the African Union in 2009, U.S. officials were concerned. In an embassy cable revealed by WikiLeaks, they noted that Libya will seek to use al Qaddafi's chairmanship to aggrandize him and promote his United States of Africa proposal. U.S. multinationals were also unhappy with the Libyan leader, especially his decision to cancel a $1 billion deal with the Bechtel Corporation, the largest engineering company in the U.S. with powerful connections in Washington. The fact that an operator with Bechtel's connections and deep pockets was ultimately unable to secure its contract serves as a cautionary tale for the many U.S. and Western companies seeking to enter Libya's booming market and for other U.S. companies considering major investment projects here. Gaddafi also antagonized France. After being courted by President Nicolas Sarkozy, the Libyan leader cancelled major arms deals. On oublie à quel point euh, Sarkozy il avait déroulé le tapis rouge à Colonel Kadhafi en décembre 2007 et le Colonel Kadhafi, en échange, lui avait promis 14 milliards de dollars de, contrat, de contrats. Il y avait une shopping list absolument incroyable à ridiculiser Nicolas Sarkozy parce qu'il n'y a rien eu du tout ou très très peu de choses par rapport à ce qui avait été promis. En mars 2011, as the Arab Spring spread through North Africa, France and the United States decided to act. The United Nations Security Council gave its approval. Protecting human rights provided the justification. Nos forces aériennes s'opposeront à toute agression des avions du colonel Kadhafi contre la population Benghazi. We hit Gaddafi's troops in neighboring Ajabiya, allowing the opposition to drive them out. We hit Gaddafi's air defenses. This was AFRICOM's first war, and its commander-in-chief was the first African-American president. In the words of the Obama administration, the U.S. position in the war against Libya was that of leading from behind. What is really interesting is, of course, the fact that the war was opened and directed first by AFRICOM, and then the mission was taken over by NATO. In other words, the people running the show, NATO, are themselves being run by the United States, which is formally in command of NATO. Not only that, in one of his speeches, Obama, after the uh, bombing campaign had ceased and was praising the efforts of allies in Libya, revealed that even a number of French bombing missions were in fact piloted by American pilots. The intervention of Libya is also a way of sending a, a message uh, to other African nation states that should they pursue a course of such radical defiance, radical independence, such a nationalist and anti-imperialist course, that there could be ultimate consequences that are no longer hypothetical. Gaddafi is gone. So a major obstacle in the way of American military penetration of Africa has in fact been removed. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> the fall of Gaddafi produced a shockwave that would be felt far beyond Libya. Unfortunately, there was not a very good handle on the 40,000 plus weapons that Gaddafi had. And so quickly we find out that over 35,000 of those, those weapons just atomized, they just disappeared. And so we discover that some of those weapons made, made it into northern Mali, into southern Algeria, they're in southern Libya, they're in Niger, they're everywhere. Some of those weapons fell into the hands of the Libyan rebels. Others, including anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, fell into the hands of Tuareg fighters who fought alongside Gaddafi 
because he'd supported their demands for autonomy in the Sahara. Il y a toujours eu un irrédentisme euh, Touareg. Il y a toujours eu énormément de difficultés avec les Touareg qui constituent une 3 millions de personnes, une communauté euh, qui sont de nomades, qui sont sur trois pays, hein, Niger, Mali et, et, et Tchad. Et c'est vrai que euh, finalement, euh, c'était une sorte de zone grise, une zone de non-droit où le gouvernement, les gouvernements centraux les laissaient finalement euh, faire un peu leur business et euh, le grand protecteur des Touaregs dans la région, c'est le colonel Kadhafi. Une fois que le colonel Kadhafi, euh, finalement le grand parrain de la région, a disparu, eh ben, ils sont rentrés chez eux et les revendications qu'on a connues, que ce soit au nord du Niger ou au nord du Mali, au cours des années précédentes ou des décennies précédentes, ont ressurgi. The heavily armed Tuaregs formed a new fighting force, the MNLA, and launched an offensive against the government in Bamako in January 2012. Their long-held dream of creating Azawad, an independent Tuareg homeland that would stretch across the Sahara, finally seemed within reach. But the Tuaregs were not the only fighters in the desert. Small armed groups, which had emerged a decade earlier, were now well-armed forces to be reckoned with. Acme, Mujao, and Ansar Dean say they were fighting a holy war and were recruiting among the local population. The Islamists, or I don't know how they should call them, what they were in the north, they have done about 10 years in the north of Mali, without being worried. Le nord du Mali était presque ingouvernable. Il n'y avait plus d'administration, il n'y avait plus rien là-bas. Donc ces gens-là ont trouvé un terrain fertile. But the Islam preached by these armed groups was nothing like the Islam practiced in this region for centuries. L'islam qui est là, c'est un islam modéré, c'est un islam pacifique. Même si la population elle est à 80% musulmane, elle est musulmane, c'est des pratiquants. Ce n'est pas des gens qui, qui, qui s'explosent. Ils ne connaissent pas les explosifs, ils ne connaissent pas les, les, les attentats, ils ne, tout ça, c'est des, des choses qui sont carrément étranges. Qui sont ces gens Ils sont essentiellement dans la, de la région, tous les leaderships sont algériens. Beaucoup étaient des anciens militaires algériens qui ont déserté. Et parmi les combattants, et c'est très intéressant, il y a tout. Ils viennent de Somalie, peu nombreux. Ils viennent de, euh, du Pakistan ou autre. Putting aside their ideological differences, the Tuaregs and the armed groups forged an alliance of convenience. I think the MNLA, which, from a point of view ideological, is totally opposed to the group of terrorist jihadists, has seized this opportunity because the MNLA, its enemy principal, remains the state of Mali. So all the good intentions that are around him to fight the state of Mali are welcome. And here, this was really an alliance of circumstances, and with, in fine, a reversal to the benefit of the terrorist groups. United, the rebel forces launched an offensive against Malian soldiers in several garrison towns in the north. These Malian troops had completed years of training by AFRICOM, but the training didn't pay off. Les troupes maliennes formées par les États-Unis ont été les premières à se rebeller, utilisant les bonnes méthodes de leur formation pour se battre contre l'armée nationale à Bamako. Donc les unités euh, formées se sont disloquées et, et se sont mises à se battre du côté des rebelles. Worse was yet to come. When 90 Malian soldiers were captured and summarily executed in a rebel attack, army officers in Bamako mutinied against the government they said was incapable of controlling the situation. The coup was led by one of AFRICOM's star pupils, Captain Amadou Sanogo, 
who was trained as an infantry and intelligence officer at U.S. bases in Virginia, Georgia, Texas, and Arizona. This was a guy the Americans had trained and invested time and money in, and uh, he made things 10 times worse in Mali. And then more setbacks for Africa. Tuareg and other rebel forces invaded the major cities of northern Mali. They met little resistance. In just two weeks, the country was split in two. Despite years of training and millions spent, the West's greatest sphere became a reality. A so-called Islamic State was established in northern Mali. Les organisations djihadistes euh, qui avaient imposé leur pouvoir dans les, les, les villes du nord Mali, à Gao, à Tombouctou, euh, détruisant des... Des, des tombeaux très anciens. Martyrisant la population. Ça, c'est pas une invention, c'est quelque chose de tout à fait réel. Il y avait un second argument, c'est qu'il fallait aller très vite parce que les colonnes de, de pick-up de ces combattants djihadistes avançaient vers le sud à grande vitesse et allaient prendre Bamako. Personne ne croyait à une avancée de quelques centaines, il faut, il faut donner les chiffres, c'est quelques centaines de combattants euh, djihadistes qui allaient prendre euh, une ville de 3 millions d'habitants. As the rebels move south, France came to the rescue. In 48 hours, the Hollande government deployed 4,000 troops to Mali. The Americans remained in the background, providing military intelligence and logistical support. Je crois qu'on ne dit pas souvent, mais je crois que l'objectif essentiel de la France est de dire nous sommes une grande puissance. Peut-être nous n'avons pas la puissance économique que nous avions avant, mais nous sommes un grand acteur pour la paix et la stabilité dans le monde. The rebel advance was stopped, and in just two weeks, the French regained the north. The French army claimed to have killed hundreds of so-called terrorists. The rest seemed to evaporate into the desert. The former colonial power was now the savior of the country. But was Operation Serval all that it seemed to be? Dans ces confrontations en Normalie, personne ne sait exactement ce qui s'est passé puisque les médias ont été tenus à l'écart de la guerre. Donc il n'y a pas d'image autre que celles qui ont été livrées par l'armée française. Kona, or what remains of it today? The town is key to understanding what really happened during Operation Serval. It was a site of a decisive battle with the fighters of Ansardine, who were surrounded here by French troops. A memorial in honor of the first French soldier killed during the clash was erected, overlooking the only road in and out of town. But what has not been memorialized is the fact that on this same road, a convoy of vehicles carrying hundreds of rebel fighters and their leader, Iara Gali, managed to escape from right under the nose of the French. On the ground, many witnesses of the conflict have questions. On a considéré que la France ne voulait pas exterminer les islamistes. Les islamistes ont été repoussés, c'est tout. Dans un premier temps, de stopper l'avancée vers le sud, ce qui a été fait assez rapidement. Dans un deuxième temps, de déstabiliser les bases arrières des groupes terroristes. La question qui saute aux yeux, c'est ces pick-up, qu'est-ce qu'ils sont devenus 
au lendemain du début de l'intervention Serval. Il n'y a qu'une seule route qui conduit vers le nord. Il aurait été facile, avec les moyens aériens dont dispose la France, de les intercepter. Donc, il semble bien qu'il y a eu une dimension politique très forte dans cette intervention qui a été plus importante que la dimension militaire. In this shadow war, what interest might the French have in going easy on the forces they were supposed to be fighting? Les Français étaient favorables et travaillaient à une certaine autonomisation du Nord Mali, Touareg, par rapport à euh, Bamako. Pour forcer le Sud à accepter à être plus docile au diktat de la France, à, à travers la firme Areva, euh, exploite les mines d'Arlit, qui sont à 300 km de la frontière malienne, en face du nord du Mali. Donc ça a été invoqué comme une des causes de l'intervention française parce que c'est une région sensible. Et en même temps, au sud d'Arlit, il y a d'énormes gisements inexploités d'uranium. Et du point de vue de la France, il y a la volonté de garder la main sur les ressources d'uranium qu'elle n'exploite pas pour le moment euh, ou dont elle retarde l'exploitation, mais pour empêcher d'autres euh, d'avoir accès à ces ressources. Far from the desert sands of the Sahara, the future of the region is being determined. And France is not the only one with interests here. Representatives of oil companies, venture capitalists and African officials in charge of energy gathered in London, the financial capital of Europe. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and all welcome to this 11th African Independence Forum. Despite the chaos, wars and revolutions, the interests of Europeans and Americans remains high in what may be the largest untapped oil reserves on the continent, the El Dorado of the Sahel, the Taudeni Basin, which extends from Mauritania to Algeria across North Mali. There's a decent sized resource, but in a vast, vast area, probably bigger than the whole of Texas or uh, partly two thirds of Europe, for instance. So you can imagine very few wells in this vast area, not enough to test the realities. Uh, it will take a long time to put this basin to full testing. Despite a recent decline in the import of gas and African oil to the United States, the interests of major US energy companies in Africa has not decreased. The needs of Asia and Europe will not stop growing. Nearly $2 trillion of investments in African oil and gas are expected in the next two decades. On sait tous qu'on va vers une raréfaction des ressources pétrolières et que ces, dernières grands, ces derniers grands bassins pétroliers euh, d'Afrique vont avoir une importance croissante au fil des années et qu'il est très important de se prépositionner pour l'exploitation de ces ressources. In May 2014, President Obama announced that he would allocate an additional $5 billion to the fight against global terrorism. But as we move to a train and advise mission in Afghanistan, our reduced presence there allows us to more effectively address emerging threats in the Middle East and North Africa. So earlier this year, I asked my national security team to develop a plan for a network of partnerships from South Asia to the Sahel. This strategy has been very persuasive. An increasing number of African governments have signed on to the AFRICOM program, like in Niger, where the US military brought together African forces composed of 1,000 soldiers from 17 countries for military exercises. Footlock is uh, an international exercise. Uh, and this year, we, we typically have it in different areas of, of Africa. It's a tremendous opportunity for us all to work together and learn from one another. During 2013 alone, AFRICOM has organized 10 exercises on the Flintlock model, 55 other operations, and 400 safety seminars with 49 African states. The United States has also established drone bases in Djibouti, Niger, Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia, South Sudan, Burkina Faso, and the Seychelles. 
In September 2014, the United States announced that they were sending 4,000 troops to Liberia as support during the Ebola crisis and to coordinate other unspecified military activities. Not to be outdone, France also announced plans to increase its military presence in the Sahel with a redeployment of 3,000 troops. The increasing militarization of Africa is a new profit center, coveted by the military-industrial complex with millions of dollars of contracts for arms manufacturers and private contractors. Imaginez-vous s'il y a la paix et la stabilité dans la région. Ça veut dire quoi? Ça veut dire diminuer le budget de la défense. Beaucoup de gouvernements dans notre région ne veulent pas que le budget de la défense diminue. La paix, ça veut dire plus de pression populaire pour des élections libres et transparentes. The United Nations has established a peacekeeping force of 12,000 troops to help stabilize Mali. Among them, the Chinese military as well as African troops trained by AFRICOM. The arsenal of these peacekeepers includes surveillance drones and Apache attack helicopters. More than 130 years after the Berlin Conference, a new division of the African continent is underway as new powers seek to ensure oil supplies, strategic minerals, arable land, and even the water under the desert sands. Ça veut dire qu'en réalité, on ne veut pas poser les véritables problèmes. C'est comme si l'Occident vit des guerres. Il faut nécessairement créer des guerres. Il faut qu'il y ait une guerre pour justifier sa puissance, quelle qu'elle soit. The so-called war against terror in the Sahara is more than it seems. The battles waged here are part of a larger struggle for influence and control in a world of shrinking resources. This battle, the fight for the Earth's bounty, is the real, endless war. Among the poorest in the world, unemployment is rampant and most people survive hand to mouth. Yet, in the 13th century, the Mali Empire extended over much of West Africa and was extraordinarily wealthy and powerful. Salt, ivory and gold made it a major crossroad for global trade of the time. But inevitably, these riches would lead to conquests. Nous avons le sentiment d'être en continuité d'une histoire. Nous sommes la transition entre l'Afrique du Nord et l'Afrique eh, qui touche eh, l'océan, l'Afrique forestière. Et donc, ce, ce point de vue fait que nous avons une position stratégique essentielle qui contrôle le Mali, contrôle l'Afrique de l'Ouest, <laughs> pour ne pas dire l'Afrique. <laughs> c'est une position, c'est absolument clair. Et, et, et donc, eh, cet espace devient un espace de convoitise. The imperial European powers unveiled their plans to colonize Mali and the rest of Africa at the Berlin Conference in 1885. La colonisation s'est présentée comme une véritable rupture. rupture. Savannas in the south has become an important new front in the so-called war against terrorism. But is the official narrative the fight against terrorism masking a larger battle? The resources are plentiful. They, there's gas, there's oil, there's coltan, uh, gold, uh, copper, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Toute la, la, la période actuelle est marquée par ce qu'on pourrait appeler a new scramble for Africa, c'est-à-dire un nouveau partage de l'Afrique. The resource wars of the 21st century have already begun.
At the center of today's troubled region of the Sahel is the nation of Mali. C'est même une césure, hein, comme on dit, c'est-à-dire c'est une opération presque chirurgicale. Britain, Belgium, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Italy and France each got their share. The French colonial empire extended over much of Western and Northern Africa. It provided the raw materials like the oil from Algeria necessary for the industrial and military rise of post-war France. On September 13, 1960, France detonated its first atomic bomb in Regan, in the Algerian Sahara. Le fil rouge, c'est le pétrole et l'uranium. L'uranium, c'est l'uranium du Niger. Quand on parle d'uranium, c'est pas simplement l'uranium, on pense toujours aux centrales d'Areva maintenant, mais l'uranium, c'était pendant très longtemps surtout de l'uranium militaire pour la force de dissuasion nucléaire française. Donc on voit bien que c'est intéressant de voir que finalement le Sahara, c'est quand même toujours le minerai le plus stratégique de la puissance nucléaire et quand la France Ah, si elle a eu son fauteuil et son poste au Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies, c'est non seulement parce que c'est une puissance nucléaire, mais aussi pour ses intérêts en Afrique. Et les deux sont liés, c'est-à-dire l'Afrique nucléaire, et c'est ce qui donne à la France finalement son rôle de puissance moyenne. But the winds of freedom were blowing across Africa, and France was to lose all its colonies. The independence of Algeria was particularly painful, in part because of its strategic oil reserves. After eight years of bloody fighting, the French were forced to withdraw. Il ne faut pas oublier que quand la France euh, s'est fait euh, virer de l'Algérie, c'est vrai qu'il fallait trouver, pour la France, pour De Gaulle, il fallait trouver euh, du pétrole euh, ailleurs, et il a trouvé ce pétrole en Afrique subsaharienne, en particulier dans les pays comme le Gabon, le Congo. But the euphoria of independence was short-lived and masked a new reality. France retained troops, bases, and political influence over its former colonies. The policy of France-Afrique was born. C'était tellement un système intégré, politique, militaire. January 2013. 4,000 French soldiers are deployed in Mali. Their mission, to stop separatist Tuareg rebels advancing on the capital, Bamako. But Operation Serval is different from the long series of interventions by France in its former African colonies. Today, the French are not the only ones with interests in the region. They have to deal with new players, China, and now the United States. Africa is now a key territory on the global chessboard of the 21st century. From Libya to the Central African Republic, from South Sudan to Northern Mali, Conflict and chaos has spread throughout the continent. At the heart of this turmoil, a strategic territory, the Sahel. The vast region that straddles the Sahara to the north and the